I am so excited about our next guest. I have been in awe of her work uh, for many years. I do need her to correct the pronunciation of her name so I get it right, but Tithi Bhattacharya, is that, did I get it? Absolutely right. What was that? Oh, I think right. That was absolutely right. Yay! (laughs) (laughs) I tried very hard. I listened to all these YouTube, I was like, I listened to many people interview you, but you know, they're all over the place as they are with my name. Um, Of course, uh, Tithi is the author, the co-author of Feminism for the 99%, a manifesto. She is associate uh, professor and director of global studies at Purdue University. And she worked as a main organizer for the International Women's Strike in the United States, which hopefully we will have again soon. Tithi, it is a joy having you on. Um, Thank you for for being here. uh, We start off with a show talking about it's been 100 years since women earned the right to vote in the United States, uh, and we are just a few days before the election. But it doesn't seem like we've solved a lot of our problems. Um, So I want to talk a little bit about this moment in particular. You know, we are in the midst of an economic recession, possibly worse, uh, wages, there are poverty wages everywhere, inadequate health care, border policing, climate change, a housing crisis. These are the ordinary fears of families, and it seems like it's hitting women the hardest, uh, as it always does, but very, very hard right this second. Um, and it's not being discussed enough through the lens of women and working women um, this election cycle. Is that because this, this liberal feminism sort of has sucked up all the oxygen from the room? Well, first of all, Nariki, thank you so much for having me on the show. And um, thank you for making time for talking about this. Because, you know, as you correctly point out, um, so these these issues loom before us right now, right? But I think Uh, if we go back to what you just said, um, has not been seen enough from the lens of women. Uh, Well, actually, the election is all about women, right? I mean, everybody is talking about, you know, women being in power, you know, for the first time, a woman is head of CIA, women are, uh, you know, in in, um, positions uh, of power as CEOs. So people are talking about women. But what people are not talking about, as you correctly uh, pointed out, is working women, right? The ordinary women who are watching this show, who are at home struggling to make ends meet, whose uh, poverty wages combined with the lack of uh, childcare or any infrastructure of childcare in this country um, is is creating an unbelievable crisis in, in families across the board right now. So... That is, so I think we have to be very clear that if liberal media talks about women, we have to ask which women, right? Is it the women who have the right to close those borders, drone Mm. mama or sisters in other countries, um, uh, preside over these poverty wages in the workplace? Are we talking about those women and are we celebrating the achievement of those women is this about Gina Haspel and uh, you know um, and and lean in feminism, mm-hmm. or are we talking about the women who are the victims of these policies? Uh, and actually, I, I use the word victim uh, advisedly. They want us to be victims of this policy, but we are the survivors of these policies, mm-hmm. and we are the resistors of these policies. So let's talk about those women. Um, when we talk about women's issues or feminist issues, because feminism is a set of politics. It's not about women achieving power, but it is about the vast majority of women resisting the power uh, which which tries to control our lives. You you start off the book, I'm so happy. I mean, it was was a great way to start off the book, uh, talking about Facebook COO uh, Sheryl Sandberg, and, and I'm quoting your book saying, Uh, In the spring of, first words of the book, in the spring of 2018, Facebook COO Sheryl Sandberg told the world that we should, quote, it would would be a lot better off if half of all countries and companies were run by women and half of all homes were run by men, end quote. Um, And then you later say she, as a leading exponent of corporate feminism, Sandberg had already made a name and a buck for herself by urging women managers to lean in at the company boardroom 
And as the former chief of staff of U.S. Treasury Secretary Larry Summers, the man who deregulated Wall Street, she had no qualms about counseling women that success won through toughness in the business world was the royal road to gender equality. This is what, I mean, reading that again today uh, stood out to me in this crisis because in 2008, Joe Biden and Obama Biden administration appointed Larry Summers and Tim Geithner to oversee the crisis from the top up. Yet this crisis is it, it can't be handled the same way. I mean, I even think that Joe Biden may realize that whether or not he believes in, he, I don't think he has a choice. So what would you say at this moment are is the leverage that working women, union leaders, uh, union uh, unions that are, are led by women, unions that are made up of women. What leverage do they have in this moment, potentially with the Biden administration? Let's just start with that. So, uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you've seen uh, Susan Faludi's uh, piece in the New York Times this morning. Um, I'm a I'm big fan of Susan Faludi. I think, uh, you know, a backlash was a formative uh, text um, as I was trying to shape my uh, feminism. But one of the things she says is that, uh, you know, she she actually talks very powerfully in this uh, New York Times piece about um, uh, Trump's machismo. And she argues that even though people say that this is a vintage machismo, you know, borrowed from uh, uh, World War II kind of, you know, Iwo Jima, go rah rah bomb everyone kind of thing it is actually a very modern machismo uh trump's machismo is a very modern kind of masculinity and that part is very powerful but then she also goes on to argue that um if if um if we want to talk about a certain kind of masculinity we have to talk about a masculinity that takes into account care and mm. service oriented masculinity right that's not about uh, hitting people over the head uh, uh, or, or bombing people. It's about care and um, caring for communities and collectivities. And she s writes this in the Times this morning that Biden actually embodies that um, that, um, uh, that that model of mas masculinity. And I was uh, distressed to read yeah. that. <laughs> I was you. very distressed to read that because you know, I've been writing about care and care work for a while now. And um, to me, uh, you know, the statements, uh, forget Biden's history in uh, backing segregation, forget Biden's history in the crime bill, in the um, drone attacks throughout the Obama, 80 years of Obama administration, through the immigration policies where Obama deported so many people. I mean, I'm forgetting all that, but just at this moment with a fantastic uh, BLM uprising uh, across our towns and cities, um, uh, after the terrible, terrible shooting in, in Philadelphia two days ago, Joe Biden, the Democratic uh, you know, a nominee, the presidential candidate, comes up and says, what we have to be careful about is looting. Okay, that to me, is not a model of care that right. to me is misrepresenting care care is about collective um healing care is about whether our communities have resources whether our communities have schools whether women in these communities um have uh have not just have good jobs to bring up their children but have safe neighborhoods for their children to go to school have a, a, a safe um, uh, passage from school to home rather than from school to prison, right? right so right. that's what we call care, uh, you know? So to me, this feminist washing of Joe Biden is quite distressing because it tells me that uh, there, there will be challenges for us as a left with the Biden presidency, and we cannot let our guard down. You know, if we're voting for Biden in these elections just to get Trump out, we cannot let lose our tools of critical thought right. and lose our tools of analysis with a Biden presidency. In fact, we should sharpen them because we're going to need it the most with the recession coming and a pandemic looming. So this summer, uh, as you mentioned, the BLM uprisings, it, it seemed as if the class consciousness around BLM um, and the legacy of 
of, of slavery that is intrinsically tied to capitalism was started to spread in a way to, to folks who may not have been as aware of it. And I look at this moment and think, well, what, what would it take for us as a collective, women as a collective, to understand that capitalism, uh, predatory you know, forms of capitalism, it, it, it's, it's, it, it's built off of exploiting women? I mean, how do we get to that point? So, I mean, I, I think you mentioned uh, you mentioned unions before, and you're talking about collectivities. And I think it's really quite significant that the greatest tool that working women have, um, the, the strike, it was uh, Sarah Nelson of the Flight Attendants Union in, in January of 2019, who first mentioned uh, the general strike as a weapon to, to talk about, uh, to, to stop Trump from going ahead and shutting down the government, right? Um, and I think that has been discussed in recent times as well. You know, if if Trump tries to hijack the elections um, uh, after November third, then working people should um, should talk about um, a, a general strike. We should organize. And I mean, it, just to be clear, even if there isn't a general strike, um, and and if folks. Uh, if Trump is trying to hijack the elections, I think we should organize in our communities um, at the very least, you know, because uh, this is this will be a, an unprecedented thing to happen in in any um, circumstances need to be opposed. But to go back to your question, so I think workplaces and shutting down the workplaces, which is the motor of capitalism, is a very important um, tool that we as uh, workers have in this system. But I don't think our analysis needs to stop at the doors of the workplace and only pay attention to the wage gap or to unemployment figures, because then we fail to see the multiple ways in which um, wage work actually orchestrates the unwaged slices of our lives, you know? So um, uh, ecologists, I like to... Um, 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 use as a model, they use the term cascade effect, right? Mm -hmm. as, as a concept to understand how primary extinction of a species can actually trigger um, multiple secondary extinctions, mm -hmm. right? So I think that the wage, uh, the capitalist wage, um, the, the tyranny of it has a similar cascade effect on our ability to live our lives. And this is most evident in the lives of women and most evident in the lives of women of color. So if we consider the health of black women and Latinas during this pandemic, low wages certainly, you know, determine the kind of health care uh, these women have had or whether they've had it at all. But we should not only be concerned about low wages in the here and now. Historically, black communities have been forced to live in neighborhoods that have poor air quality, and or contaminated water. Black communities are 75% more likely to live near polluting industries, right? And, and women in these communities bear the brunt right. of these sort of historic tendencies of oppression. So we can't simply talk about wages when it comes to women because unwaged labor of women hold up half of society. So it right. is the precondition to the wage. And not to mention, I mean, just just while you're, I have a memory of Cory Bush, who um, was was recently uh, won the nomination in St. Louis against a a, a long, decades long uh, congressman named Lacey Clay, part of the establishment, and she during her campaign, she ended up what she thought getting COVID, but when she went to the hospital twice, the doctor said, well, we don't know. I actually saw her in the hospital, hooked up to the ventilator. So of course, this is COVID. What you, she said, they didn't diagnose me. Sure enough, um, there are countless reports coming out now about how women of color, black women across America are going into the hospital and not being taken seriously when it comes to COVID, um, which, of course, uh, illustrates another issue that we face in the healthcare system. So uh, this is, it, it seems like we're primed for some form of a general strike, um, Women led, uh, whether whether they don't want to or not, <laughs> it's 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 those uh, frontline communities um, workers that 
could show up for a strike and withhold their labor. But simultaneously, you know, there is an opportunity to talk about these other systemic issues in a way that when the the Black Lives Matter uprising, suddenly people started to understand their racial bias in a way that they had never been educated in school or in their communities or nobody around them, you know, white uh, white liberals weren't even aware. Um, what would it, what kind of coalition building do we have to, I mean, it's, it's very hard when you have this liberal Clintonian style, Hillary Clinton style feminism. Um, and, and, and I, I, you know, I would have to mention the women's March. Like it seemed like when they, the women's March was being organized, they understood the need for a coalition to organize around what was probably, I would say some progressive, um, a, a progressive platform for women, but it, it seemed to be taken over by this greater narrative, this more powerful narrative um, of white women's feminism. So how do we build a coalition without that happening? So I think one of the things we argue in the book, um, the manifesto, is that just like we are talking about a feminism for the 99%, it is very vital that we talk about an anti-racism of the 99%, right? So Kamala Harris getting one of the top tickets of the uh, of the land uh, in order to be in the White House is not a victory for ordinary uh, working class black women, okay? It is certainly a victory for historical uh, wrongs being justed, justed, okay? So that, I, I let's, let's be very clear, to see a black woman in the White House um, in, in America was unimaginable. So there is, there is certainly a, a, a sense of achievement there, which we cannot underestimate, right? But we also cannot say that being in the White House is a positive thing because mm -hmm. the White House is symbolic of the heart of American empire, okay? Right. It is the heart of neoliberal austerity. The policies coming out of the White House is are not going to be policies that talk about how to better the lives of ordinary working class black women, okay? Whether a black person is in the White House or not, as we saw during the uh, Obama era, right? We saw black poverty actually went up yeah. in the eight years of, of Obama's administration. But I was in Grand Park in Chicago in the night of, um, you know, uh, 2008 uh, with my uh, three month old infant daughter, mm -hmm. just because it was such an exciting women a moment for um, millions of uh, black women that night that, you know, to be part of that was was being part of history. But we knew as socialists and activists that Obama was not going to be our friend in in the work uh, in the White House. So I think when we talk about coalition building, we have to start from the bottom. We mm. cannot depend on the top. Okay, that's right. So that's the first thing that we can't. There, no one's going to come to rescue us. We're going to have to do this ourselves. That's the first thing. We don't look for saviors from above. The second thing is that we don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are actually histories of organizing that uh, that we have in this country. We've seen the brilliant BLM uprisings throughout the summer and continuing even today. Okay, mm -hmm. there it, there lies our resources for hope. Okay, now imagine right now the 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 uprisings are uh, sort of responsive to particular uh, police acts of police violence, etc. But I can see, uh, I can imagine a network building up between the activists in various cities and, and certain some of those networks already exist. Movement for Black Lives already exists, right? So those networks becoming effective in the in the next four years is, is very vital. The second is, Nine million people have died of COVID in this country, okay? But 12 million people are in unions. So, mm. you know, we have to keep those numbers in mind. And those 12 million people who are in organized unions can stand up and speak for the nine million people who have been neglected and, and left to die essentially by, by the Trump, uh, Trump administration. So I think we have uh, you know, really wonderful histories of uh, 
labor organizing in this country. We have wonderful histories of anti-racist organizing in this country. What we need right now is a national conversation that links together uh, workplaces with community activism, okay? So unions cannot simply talk about waged work because it's gonna leave out this entire history of uh, race and gender oppression that has uh, that is vital right now, and and it's 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 in people's minds, it's in our lives, um, and and um, unions have the collective power to actually have that conversation. And similarly, community activists need to think of ways to ally to labor, organize labor, and 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 uh, make that happen. Uh, before we go, can I just ask you a little about uh, internationalism through the feminist lens, what that looks like? So I <laughs> I was recently working with uh, my friends and comrades at Code Pink, and one of the things I said was, you know, if I could have a soundbite on what a feminist foreign policy looks like, then my soundbite would be, there are no feminist bombs, just as there are no feminist borders, right? Mm -hmm. So an international internationalism has to be at the beating heart of feminism, right? We cannot have liberation of women, even liberation of black and brown women in the United States, if that liberation comes at the cost of empire abroad, right? So we cannot have a welfare state, a robust welfare state program, okay? Let's say we get a robust welfare state program uh, in the United States that really caters to the needs of black and brown women. Okay, we have a good child work, uh, child uh, care system and universal child care system and so on. But we cannot have that if America's power and the money of that is dependent on imperial interests abroad. Okay, so that kind of gain, you know, I, I was in Copenhagen last year and um, it, you know the, the 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 heart of social democracy, uh, wonderful uh, maternity and paternity leaves for working parents, wonderful healthcare for everyone, and immigrant Muslim families living in ghettos. Okay, right. so that cannot be our feminism. Our feminism has to be internationalist and anti-imperialist in order to be the kind of feminism for the 99% that we need at this moment badly. Is is there one place or one group or, or a one moment in time to reference? For feminism for the 99%? Well, I mean, I mean, internationalist feminist. I mean, it's if, if Copenhagen and I'm very familiar, like if, if they're not it, then then who do we look to? Well, I think we look to the international feminist strike movement right. that began in 2017, you know, right Which now. Which you were a part of. Let's, yeah. Well, yes, I was a very small part of in, in the United States, but it was, it was so fantastic, because, and it still is, that because it was precisely the kind of international cooperation and networks from below, you know, mm. that joined together to make March 8th uh, shut down several cities across the world. Okay, and and remember one of the 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 slogan that united us all was solidarity is our weapon. Right. Mm -hmm. So, international solidarity and the international women's strike. I'm so um, is so energized to see Poland actually going on strike right now. Polish women because of their abortion ban. I'm right. so energized to see uh, Chile and um, uh, the, them voting for the democracy, uh, the, the new constitution, constitution. the anti-dictatorial constitution, and the movements on the streets being led by women. So I think the we need to reinvigorate the question of the women's strike here in the United States and kind of join up with our sisters abroad um, in in a movement of international solidarity. I have so many more questions for you. <laughs> but unfortunately, we ran out of time. But I would, I mean, if, if you're open, we'd love to have you on again, maybe once we have a sense of what's going to happen uh, in yeah, this election right, world. Exactly. But it's Thank been you, such an honor. Uh, Tithi Bhattacharya, right? Correct. Okay, got it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. 
Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.